Welcome to More Than a Sign, where we talk to some of Milwaukee's most productive realtors, up-and-coming realtors, and those that work alongside us. However, rather than being a platform for shameful self-promotion, these are intimate discussions about the journey, the struggle, the fear, and ultimately, the personal growth along the way. At the end of the day, nobody really cares about what we do. All that really matters is who we are. Today, we're going to learn who Shar Borg is. But before we do, let me tell you a few things about what Shar has done. So the amazing Shar, this year, Shar and her team have sold approximately $50 million worth of homes, which is incredible. Shar just joined Compass, who are new to town but are making big waves. Shar has a team of nine people, and one of the things I like and respect most about Shar is that her clients range from $40,000 to $4 million. Everybody's treated as a VIP, but no disrespect intended, Shar, who really cares about that. Let's talk about who Shar is and not what Shar does. That sounds awesome. I prefer that. Thank you. So. I think that two-dimensional figures, right? Like people see our signs, they paint pictures of who we are, how we got here. Um, you and I are friends outside of work, which I feel fortunate about, and our families are friends. And you have a fascinating journey for how you got here. So um, let's just kind of freestyle and, and start like most people think that you grew up in the North Shore of Milwaukee right. and that you were destined to be a real estate agent from a little girl and that not at all. No, that's not my story at all. <laughs> so actually I'm, um, I'm from the East Coast. Um, I'm from a working class community in Baltimore. I grew up, uh, my parents worked at the steel mill at Bethlehem Steel and the best thing that you could sort of hope for was, you know, time and a half and, uh, you know, Miller's at the end of the day. Mm. My parents worked really, really hard. I think like every parent, they want their kids to, you know, do better than them. And their goal was for me to go to college. What's really cool is, so my mom worked second shift. Mm. So she works three to 11. And um, every day she would call me on her dinner break. And, um, I could always keep track of the time based on the news, right? So my mom would leave at three and then there would be news that came on at five Mm -hmm. and then there would be news that came on at six. And I knew that shortly after the six o'clock news, my mom would call me at seven for the dinner break. And then, um, you know, I would talk with her for like half hour, 45 minutes, and then I'd watch all my favorite TV shows, you know, The Love Boat and Different Strokes and all those. And, um, and I knew that after the 11 o'clock news, my mom would be home by 1130. Hmm. And so my life was sort of based around the news. And it was the same newscasters every day at five, six, and 11. I knew I could count on those folks. And I thought, when I grow up, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be that person for some little girl at home who's Hmm. waiting for her mom to get home from work. And so from the time I was a little girl, I always knew that I would be a newscaster. So I could Hmm. be there at 5, 6, and 11 Mm -hmm. um, for kids at home. And so, um, yeah, that's my background. I actually um, did go on to college and I studied broadcast journalism um, in Boston Mm -hmm. and landed my first real job in TV at WISN. So that's what brought me to Milwaukee. And what year was that? So that was 96. I came here in 96. Okay. So let's not skip over Peter. Okay. Peter occurred before WISN, right? He did. Share the story about how you met. Right. So Peter is just, he is the rock. As a matter of fact, I think if you translate his name, Peter Borg, it actually means rock fortress. And that is what <laughs> this man is in my life. But, sure. um, Peter. Can I call him that from now on? <laughs> Call him Rock, Rock Fortress, Fortress. <laughs> <laughs> also known as The Rock, <laughs> okay. in the nerdiest, most intellectual <laughs> way possible. But um, so Peter, yeah, he's he's my guy. We've been married for, it'll be 27 years this summer, but we met um, when I was in college. Um, I met him at a church in inner city Boston. We were both tutors at this church. And so- 
all these college students and like young professionals would come from like our side of town and go to inner city Boston and tutor these kids. And some of the other college students who were heading back to BU, which is where I went to school, there were Harvard and MIT and, you know, Northeastern students. And somebody said, hey, somebody ask Peter if he wants to go back to, you know, our side of town with us. And I was like, oh, I'll ask him, what's he look like? Oh, you know, he's blonde, he's blue eyes, glasses, he's probably wearing a blue shirt because I swear <laughs> he only wears blue shirts, but they look so good on him. Funny. So yeah, I went and found Peter and he was like, yeah, I'll go back to, you know, that side of town with you guys. And so we just started talking and um, we we're walking to the tea and we we're talking, talking, talking. And um, while we were sitting on the tea, he told me about his senior honors thesis and how one day he would be a history professor, and how um, his focus had really been on trying to understand why it was that when we were little kids, it just didn't matter who you played with, right? It didn't mm -hmm. matter if you were black or white or Jewish or Asian, like all the kids played together on the playground. But by the time you got to middle school and high school, like the lunch tables were totally segregated and that just didn't make any sense to him. Mm -hmm. So he had done this really fascinating research going all the way back to slave plantations to understand the relationship between enslaved children and owner's children mm. and um, how we keep sort of playing that out today. Really fascinating. Yeah. I was just like, oh my gosh, this mm. guy is amazing. I got off the train and I thought, that's crazy. That was my husband. Wow. And I'm not that girl. Mm -hmm. I'm super, you know, level headed and I don't get like, you know, easily swayed. But I just thought that's my husband. Hmm. But I prayed. I'm a person whose faith is just, I mean, my faith is just really important to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, if this is the man for me, then you have to make it clear to him. True story really quickly. Um, I would see him at the tutoring program. We'd say, Hey, how you doing? You know, we never were like on a date. He was never like, I'm into you. You're so pretty. Like none mm, of this. Right. But one day he called me up and he's like, do you want to take a walk? Yeah, let's take a walk. We walked around Boston for five hours and we just talked and talked and talked. And um, he was applying for a job out of the country. And um, I thought, I don't know how he's going to do that because like we're going to get married mm. and, you know, I'm not going out of the country. I'm going to be a TV reporter. Sure. So I asked him, hey, how's that application going? And he said to me, you know, it's funny, you should ask. When you got off the train that day, I just really felt like God told me that you're going to be my wife. Wow. And so I'm going to stay here and marry you. Mm -hmm. And here we are 27 years later. And I get goosebumps. You know, I heard this story once before and I get goosebumps because it's so special and it's so genuine. It's mm -hmm. really nice. And the two of you have created a beautiful, beautiful family. I feel very, very privileged. I'm so thankful to build a life with him. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, so you come to Wisconsin, you work for WISN, and you start to taste success and start to build up, you know, the American dream, right? Right. Let's talk about the steps you took and how that had an unexpected turn in your life. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I was a reporter, um, you know, loved my job, was really good at it. I, you know, was nominated for an Emmy. I think I was, you know, 24, 25 years old, my first job. And, um, you know, everybody thought, oh, you know, sky's the limit. Um, but then we started our family and, um, just really I had traveled the world. I, you know, I had had the privilege of interviewing, you know, heads of state, including, you know, the president. I, you know, had gone to Israel. Um, I had done so many things in news. And then we found out we were having our first child. And I thought, well, I don't know if, you know, my news director, or my executive producer is going to give me a hug and tell me that they love me. Mm -hmm. But um, I know that this kid, you know, will need me. And so I decided to walk away from that career and be a stay at home mom. I had our first son, Elijah, um, and I was a stay-at-home mom. And then we had our second child, um, Lizzie. Mm -hmm. And I started to get the itch for news again. I really, you know, I missed TV. Um, and so I was seriously considering going back into TV. I had a job offer. But our Lizzie, she at the time was about 10 months old. 
And she had changed on me. Like she was born healthy, normal, happy baby, you know, all is right with the world. Here we are, you know, husband, wife, son, daughter, and a dog. I Mm -hmm. mean, like, and, but something wasn't quite right with Lizzie. She had changed and I kept taking her to the doctors and, you know, they were like, oh, it's an ear infection. It's a sinus infection, but that didn't feel right. Um, and so I'll never forget the day that I got the actual, um, job offer to go back to TV. I told my husband, we should take Lizzie to Children's Hospital just to, just to make sure. And, uh, life changed forever at that point. We uh, took her to the ER because the urgent care wasn't open and they did a chest x-ray and literally within minutes, they discovered that Lizzie's heart was failing. And over the next couple of days, we learned that she would need a heart transplant um, mm-hmm. or we were going to lose her. And in that moment, I just realized that God had been so gracious to me mm-hmm. to let me be a stay-at-home mom because not everybody has that opportunity. Um, But I had been able to be with her enough to recognize the change and to get her to the hospital in time. And they really felt like in a matter of weeks, we would have lost Lizzie had we not mm-hmm. brought her in. By God's grace, um, she did get her heart transplant, um, but that sort of, that was life-changing for us. At the time, Peter was in IT. Um, that's how he was, you know, providing for our family. But, um, you know, I go back to that train ride when he told me he would be a history professor mm-hmm. one day. And so he thought, you know, he was traveling like 50% of the time for his work. And he said, you know, I just don't want to be away from our family. Um, and so we started making plans, uh, really for him to go to grad school and we started investing in real estate Mm -hmm. as sort of passive income. And what year was that? So that would have been in 2000, I think 2004, 2005, we started investing in real estate. When everything was going up and you couldn't miss. Oh, the sky was the limit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could never lose money on real estate. It was to the moon like Mm -hmm. crypto is today, right? right? right. So, um, So, and at first it was great. I mean, we really were making money. You know, we were doing all right. Um, it seemed like our plan was going to work, but, um, I don't know if you were in real estate at all at like 2006, 2007. Um, yeah, as a developer at the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those of us who were sort of in it started to feel some contractions for sure. Um, that the market was about to give birth to something not great. We mm-hmm. were starting to feel those sort of like Braxton Hicks, those early, mm-hmm. um, like it was taking, we were spending more to buy a property, but it was taking longer for those properties to sell. We were rehabbing, reselling. Mm-hmm. We don't use the four letter F word flip. <laughs> we were rehabbing, reselling, but it was, t- we were paying more to get the houses and it was taking longer for them to sell. So we had a problem, like we needed a realtor, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because we were using different realtors and we didn't have the experience that we felt like we needed to have. So Peter was like, sure, you should get your license. Um, And uh, And it really wasn't it. It wasn't by choice at this point, right? mm -hmm. I mean, you had to get those sold. I had to get those properties sold. And Mm -hmm. really the agents that we were working with were not able to make it happen. And so if nothing else, I needed to be in the nitty gritty to understand what was happening in the market, Mm -hmm. why my properties weren't selling and to see if there was anything that I could do. Mm -hmm. And so I got my license in 2006 and things were good. Um, like I was selling a lot of real estate for other Mm -hmm. people, which was so ironic, um, because I hadn't really gotten in for that reason. But then really from 2008 till 2011, when the market was very, very depressed, Mm -hmm. that's when I cut my teeth in real estate Mm -hmm. because I had to figure out how to sell properties, um, in areas that were really facing challenges. And I had to help other people who realized that I had my license to sell their properties or first time home buyers to buy properties. I really feel like I became such a great agent in those really hard times because, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? That's right. what they say. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And, um, that's, that's when I cut my teeth. Mm-hmm. And there is no better experience than having to make things happen when they're not happening. Exactly. And nobody knew 
what to do, mm-hmm. right? Um, I don't think that anybody that I was working with, any managers, any colleagues had ever experienced anything like this. I mean, you know, it was the Great Recession. Mm-hmm. Um, and the last anybody had heard of anything quite like this was the Great Depression. So nobody really had any insight. We were all trying to figure it out. And, um, we found ways by God's grace. Mm-hmm. Um, we learned to be creative. Um, we learned to be patient with ourselves and with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent a lot of time helping people to build and rebuild credit, um, so that they could have the opportunity to be homeowners. I spent a lot of time helping people who had lost jobs and lost pretty much everything not to lose their houses, mm-hmm. um, not to get foreclosed on. So, yeah. yeah, amazing experience. And for anybody that's wondering uh, about Lizzie, mm-hmm. she is beautiful. She's smart. She's away at school, right? Yes, yeah, she is. She's all of those things. Complete Thank dynamo, you. and she will do whatever she wants to do in life. So there's a happy yes. ending. To yes, the absolutely. God is story. so gracious. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, she's great. She did get her heart um, thanks to the. I can't even use the word gen- generosity. It is beyond um to say that about our donor family they mm-hmm. are our family and we say you know we have the privilege of caring for that heart that mm-hmm. gift of life every day so we don't just raise lizzie but mm-hmm. we care for jonathan christian too who sure. is her donor fantastic so. so let's touch on two things and one of the nice things about our friendship is we talk about all sorts of things, all easy and difficult, right? <laughs> all the stuff. Um, so I'd love to talk about the misperception of how you ended up with the Bucks business. I oh, think that's sure. a great story. And then I'd love to chat about your continued commitment to the city, which I don't think many people know. And I think that's very special as well. So let's yeah. touch on. Let's start with the box. Yeah. Yeah. People ask all the time, how did you get that business? You know, and I, I think people, you know, make the assumption that, oh, well, Shar's black. And so she gets these black basketball players, which I think it's really unfair to the players, honestly, to assume that they're just going to, you know, decide to work with somebody just because of their ethnicity, mm-hmm. um, you know, or, or the color of their skin. Um, although I do think that there are, are people who, you know, who see the value, um, and, and working, uh, with underrepresented minorities, but mm-hmm. that's not how this happened. Sure. Um, so how, <laughs> what happened was, um, back in 2014, I, um, prayed. <laughs> mm-hmm. I wanted to work with the Bucks. Um, there were lots of rumors, um, probably from like 2000, I started hearing, I feel like in 2013, that Herb Cole was going to sell the organization. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought, this is an opportunity. You know, whoever buys this team, they want to win. Well, you cannot win when people are unhappy, right? Happy people are productive people. And so I thought, I can help these guys be happy in Milwaukee. I am a transplant, just like most of them are going to be transplants. And Milwaukee can be kind of a hard city if you don't have your people, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have family here. You don't have relationships. And so I thought, I'm going to be the agent who helps make Milwaukee home. And so I decided that I would sort of, for lack of a better word, stalk mm-hmm. John Hammond, who was, um, he was the GM of the Bucks at the time. Mm-hmm. I just thought wherever he is, I'm going to try to be there um, so that I can get in front of him and say, you know, hey, Mr. Hammond, if you want to build a winning team and you want players who are happy, I can help them make Milwaukee home. And he was very insulated at the time, not an approachable guy. Right, mm-hmm. right. Um, and so, so I would just go to these different events and there were a number of things that happened. Um, one thing that happened was, uh, gentleman who was a trainer for the Bucks at the time, his name was Rob Hackett, just moved back to Milwaukee to um to work for the Bucks. And he was from Milwaukee and he had been recommended to me as an agent. Um other people within the organization were using a different agent, but he had been recommended to me. And I did a great job for him, he said. 
And so he just started telling people within the organization and including John Hammond. And I had Mm -hmm. told him my plan was to try Mm -hmm. to get in front of John Hammond. He's like, well, I'll tell John Hammond what a good job you did. But then, you know, I would try to get to these events where John Hammond was. And I got to one event, a guy named Paul Newberger worked for a company called Thrivent at the Mm -hmm. time. And um, he was having this um, intimate event where John Hammond was going to be. And he was like, sure, you should come because I know you're trying to get in front of John Hammond. Listen, I was telling everybody. It was no secret. Like, I, mm-hmm. if I could get in front of him, I was going to make it happen. So, um, lo and behold, John Hammond comes to this event. I'm at the event. John Hammond tells, you know, the vision of where the Bucks are going under new ownership. And um, I decided this is going to be my opportunity. Well, he was leaving the event early. So I thought, well, I'm just going to sneak out and meet him at the door. Mm -hmm. And so I get to the door and there's John Hammond and I go right up to him and I stick out my hand and I say, hello, Mr. Hammond, I'm, and he says, Sharborg. Wow. And he like totally threw me (laughs) off my game. And he's Mm -hmm. like, Shar, everybody is telling me about you. Everybody's saying that I need to meet you and I hear only great things about you. And so here's my card. Call me tomorrow. I'm going to put you in touch with our vice president of player relations. And, uh, I think you're going to be our, our person. Yeah. And that was 2000, I think 2014, 2015. And that's tenacity, Mm -hmm. right? That is having a goal. That's having a strategy to achieve that goal and, and being relentless. That's exactly right. People think that things are just sort of handed to you. Anybody who has accomplished anything knows that nothing is just handed to you. Right. You know, we all have our journeys that we have to take and we all, you know, have a mission that we're on and I I worked for it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I will take it back to my background in TV though. I mean, in TV, you had to shove the microphone in anybody's face, Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm, there's nobody who intimidated me. I mean, if I can, you know, put the microphone in Tommy Thompson's face, you know, or and Bill Clinton's face, you know, then I can certainly go to John Hammond. So I I just use those same skills to build my business. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting business in that you, like we started out, you have clients, I'm using round numbers, but that spend $40,000 on a home and you have clients that spend $4 million on a home. And not many people in our industry can say that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that for a second? Well, imagine this, Rick. Imagine like somebody hands you $40,000 and they say, spend it wisely. I mean, $40,000 is not a little bit of money. I don't care. I don't Mm -hmm. care who you are. It's not a little bit of money. And so if somebody comes to me and they say, you know, I've been pre-approved for 40 or 50, you know, $75,000, they're coming to me because they trust that I'm going to help them to invest that wisely. Mm -hmm. They're getting the privilege of beginning to build the American dream. And a lot of these um, first time buyers are people who never thought that they would have that privilege. And historically, we know were kept out of even getting into uh, into the game. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for me, I have felt that it's a privilege that they would come to me um, with this portion of money. And say, Shar, will you help me to build something for my family that I can pass on to my children? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm not going to turn them away. If they've worked hard enough mm-hmm. to get their credit in place and to get a pre-approval, I'm going to help them get the keys to right. that door. For um, sure. So, and you know, one thing that was an eye opener for me, and we, we talk about this. Um, that we both mentor people that work and live in the city. I've often lamented the fact over the last year, let's say, that a home in the North Shore that would have sold for a million dollars two years ago is now a million two and how difficult that is. Right. And through some of these people that I mentor, I've learned that there are homes in our city that would have sold for $30,000 two years ago that are 60 today. That's exactly right. And if you, if you don't think about it, it's a $30,000 increase. But if you really think about it, you stop and think about it. Here's a family that's been saving up for that $30,000 house. That's right. And that house has doubled in price and that 
dream of theirs always seems to be an arm's length away. That's right. That's exactly right. And here's the amazing thing. Like I really have seen buyers buy like a $50,000 house and in this market, it truly has increased to $150,000. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now they have $100,000 equity. Now they have maybe $100,000 to put down on their next house. Well, $100,000 is 20% of $500,000. Right. These, these are people who bought, you know, a $50,000 house. Mm-hmm. And, and now they could, you know, maybe buy a $500,000 house. And you just think about the wealth that they're building. And not that wealth is everything, but we all have this goal of being able to provide for our families. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether you live in Fox Point or on Fond du Lac, you want to be able to provide for your family. Right. And this is a way that we can help folks to do that. And, you know, my team is really diverse. Um, we have people who work with first time home buyers at, you know, and then we have those of us who work in the luxury end. And so there's not anybody mm-hmm. that we can't, we can't help. Yeah. Nice. And we're in an ownership society. That's like right. to get ahead in our country. You have to own. You just have to. If you look at the pandemic and our federal government pumped money into people's hands, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, you know, it varied. And for so many people that aren't a part of the ownership society, they spent the money on food and clothing and rent and all of that, and it was gone. And that money really, for better or worse, ends up in the pockets of those that own. That's right. Um, so if you look at those that own homes, the homes are worth more than they've ever been worth before. Mm-hmm. If they own a business or if they own skills, though that business or those skills are worth more than they've ever been before. So I think you and I both buy into the fact that, hey, if we can get somebody to be an owner, not for us, at but all. for them. At, yeah. I mean, it really, um, it's a game changer. Right. Because now you are not a slave to someone else's whims. Right. You know, your landlord decides, and I have seen it many times. In fact, we've picked up a lot of first time buyers recently because the landlords have decided that they're going to sell the property that they've been renting mm-hmm. to these folks because the market is just too good. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, when you are in a position where you own where you sleep, you're not a slave to somebody else's whims. Exactly. And you're maybe on that first or second rung of the ladder. Right. You know, exactly. the incremental growth of life. That's exactly right. So you and Peter do well and you could live anywhere, any house anywhere. Uh, but you've made a commitment that many people haven't, which really is, I think, very meaningful. Yeah. You know, um, it's so, it's so funny to think about the fact that we could live anywhere. So we live in Sherman Park. We bought our first house in Sherman Park, gosh, 24 years ago. And it's, we bought it because it was what we could afford at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we knew we were starting a family and that I was going to be leaving my job. And so, um, you know, we needed something that we could afford on one salary. And, um, we, also, we're a mixed race family. He's white. I'm black. And we wanted to live in a community where, you know, we didn't feel like we were sort of in a fishbowl of these like weird people where everybody was there. Black people, white people, Asian people, Hispanic people, Jewish people, Muslim people. And like Sherman Park is really that. Mm-hmm. We love that community. And, um, and we've had the privilege also of inviting lots of families who maybe wouldn't have considered living in the city Mm -hmm. to consider the city, right? And so we've literally moved families in from Whitefish Bay, from Shorewood, from Mequon, from Menominee Falls into Sherman Park because um, just the sense of community that's there. Um, We look out for each other. You know, our kids play in the front yard together. And um, we started doing this um, thing. We just kind of fell into it. like. I don't know, a little more than probably 18 years ago called family dinner. 
And um, it started out with Peter's cousin, you know, lived in the neighborhood. And Peter and I have a friend who is a sister to us who moved here from Boston. She really introduced us in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Um, so we would have them over for dinner every Thursday night. And then, you know, they would invite people. And then those people would invite people. And the next thing we knew, um, for like 15 years, we would have like on a quiet night, 35 people. And like on a really Mm -hmm. wonderful summer night, we would have 75 or 80 people in our house, in our front yard, in our backyard. And Peter and I would just make dinner for Mm -hmm. them. We just called it family dinner. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you literally, we have had the chief of police sitting at the table with somebody who literally just got out of jail. Mm -hmm. And at, at family dinner, we are just family. And, um, uh, unfortunately COVID, um, put the kibosh on that. Sure. Um, but man, it was just such a, mm-hmm. such a great run and everybody was there, you know, CEOs and, you know, laborers, um, mm-hmm. just such yeah. a, such a great way to live and to raise our kids. And mm-hmm. so sounds incredible. I mean, really mm-hmm. special and. What a life you've shown your kids. You know, too many of us get caught up in the trap of things Mm -hmm. and we're, you know, too many of us are too busy. So we show our love that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, and you and I have talked about this. It's not about quality time. It's about quantity time. You have to give the people you love quantity time and they'll come up with the one that's quality, right? That's right. Um, and, and a lot of our conversations are more experiential. Mm-hmm. We don't really talk much about business or what we're going to do next year or no. what home we sold. It's really more what do we believe in and what are we thankful for and all of that. Because at the end of the day, Mary Stanky said this to me right when I got into the, into the business. She said, Shar, remember, it's the mission, not the commission. Right. And she told me that very early on. And I just, I respect her so much. She's um, a legend at Shore West. And um, just, you know, that is, that is something that I have always lived by and my team lives by. And it's the mission, not mm-hmm. the commission. Mm-hmm. Well, you certainly embody that. Thank you. Um, so as we wrap up, there are all sorts of people that are, getting into the business, let's say. And this year is going to be a challenge, um, maybe even more exaggerated than last year. Last year, we had very limited inventory, and we had extreme demand from the buyer pool. Well, we already know that inventory is going to be limited this year, but we don't know if demand is going to be there. Right. I mean, we really don't, or if it's going to be across the board. It's going to be a very interesting and probably a transitional year. Yes. So for those that are navigating this and maybe not having the success that you've earned over all these years, what advice do you give people as they head into 2022? Yeah, that's a great question. I saw this in 2006 and 2007. People got into real estate because it looked like you were just printing money, right? Mm -hmm. It looked like a get-rich-quick um, kind of an opportunity. And, it, you know, it sure seemed like that. Um, but 2008 did come. Mm-hmm. We may be approaching something like that with inflation and um, wars and rumors of wars. I mean, we just, you know, we don't know. I would say, know why you got into this business. If you have gotten into the business to serve people, to have the privilege of serving people as they are making transitions. It is never just about a house, right? It is your family. You know, somebody gets a job or they lose a job. You know, somebody gets married or they might lose a spouse. Somebody has a child or their children are, you know, leaving the nest. It's never just about a house. And if you are not thinking about what is happening and the lives of the people that you have the privilege to serve, then you are definitely in the wrong business Mm. and it cannot go well for you. But if your goal is truly to serve people, then do whatever it takes, Mm -hmm. right? It may be hard. 
Um, it likely will be hard, but find a way because you know what your mission is. And I don't know what those ways will be mm-hmm. for everybody else. Um, but for me, it will require just rolling up our sleeves. And if we have to knock on doors to find a house for somebody, we'll knock on a door. If we have to get creative about helping people to, you know, get their credit right or, you know, get financing, we're going to do that. We're going to do whatever it takes for our clients to achieve their goals Mm -hmm. and their dreams. Well, it's a great way to finish. And Shar, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your transparency. And thank you for your friendship. And where we would usually sign off there, we have to do a little bit of bragging. Okay. <laughs> we so, absolutely do. Okay. So we're going to shift gears and, um, your son, Elijah, who I know is Eli. Mm-hmm. And your awesome son, Nate, the rock star producer. Right. So, um, Nate is an engineer and producer. Eli went to school at USC and is pursuing a career in music. Correct. Um, and the two of them started working together mm-hmm. and they really kind of what they, they, they have a special connection. They, they really feel like they know and understand one another and they're putting out some really good music. They're putting out good stuff. It's really good stuff. I mean, it's, it's a sound people have literally said it's a sound that they haven't heard before. Um, one, uh, one producer, um, said, it sounds like if Kurt Cobain and Kanye had a kid, <laughs> this is what their music would sound like. I like that. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, very cool. So I think we'll head out of this with a song that <laughs> um, Eli goes by The Girl, the girl. which is super creative. Uh-huh. So this is um, performed by The Girl, engineered and produced by Nate Rubin, No Sleep is the name of his production company. And um, they're the superstars. They We're just the super- working stiffs. Right? Listen, we, that, they're the retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shar. Thank you, Rick. I don't got nothing to say, man. Y'all just want to dance.